Thanks so much, everyone. How's everyone doing after lunch? Yeah? Are the chairs like cozy or a little sleepy? No, come on, let's like, let's do it. Let's get going. Sometimes I make audiences do jumping jacks, but I'm not going to do that today. So um, I'm here to talk to you about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, uh, ruthless prioritization or how to build the best thing uh, you can with what you know today. Um, as, as product managers, I think we've heard this theme recurrently over the past couple of days, but we are constantly, um, you know, have new inputs kind of thrown at us, whether it's requests, whether it's uh, things going sideways, whether it's the results of A-B tests, uh, whether it's new things in the market, whether your competitor uh, had some new fancy launch that caught the eye of your boss. Um, how, as product managers, can we successfully navigate what sometimes feels like infinite choices um, while being confident that we are doing what is most impactful for both the business and for our users. Uh, so first, why should you listen to me? Um, I'm Cassidy. Um, I've spent over a decade in product management, which is wild. Um, I'm currently the principal group product manager uh, at Microsoft for Azure Communication Services. Uh, Ignite is today and yesterday. If you haven't watched it, check it out. Um, previously, I was leading platform teams at Pendo.io, uh, which is a um, product uh, SaaS analytics platform. Um, and before that, I was uh, leading enterprise uh, teams and business uh, at Vimeo. Um, I am based in Brooklyn, New York with my husband, with my 10-month-old, um, and where we apparently have a lot less rain. So if you want to come and, and visit, um, <laughs> I can't promise good weather, but we'll see. Um, so I think all of us have heard this adage before. Product management is both an art and a science. Um, I think most people would probably argue that prioritization is more of a science. You kind of have these well-validated inputs, you plug them into some kind of framework or a formula, uh, voila, you get your prioritization and all is good in the world. Um, what I'm here to argue today is that prioritization is really more of an art um, and why it is so valuable to utilize a framework or multiple frameworks. Um, prioritization can be really uh, messy and what sometimes feels like a fiddly process, especially from the outside uh, of product management. Um, it can also be something that can be surprisingly emotional. If, uh, you know, any of us are working in industries that are, um, you know, healthcare or education, um, where the outcomes are pretty immediate um, and impactful for what we do, um, it can feel really emotional when you kind of validate something and work towards something and it gets deprioritized. Um, so how can we um, as product managers kind of have those productive discussions and truly make sure that we are all aligned in building, you know, what is best. So this is just to call out all the work that should be done before we even get to prioritization. Um, this is a partial visualization of the product development life cycle. Um, so everything that basically leads up to prioritization. We have alignment, uh, setting project goals, um, and then the double diamond as made famous by the British Design Council in 2005 um, of problem discovery and solution framing. Uh, this really, I guess, should be more of a sort of infinity symbol where you're constantly kind of feeding through, um, discovering your problems, uh, validating them through solutions, trying to see which problems have legs, which problems don't, and trying new ones. Um, so this is just to say there's a lot of work that goes into um, you know, all of this before you even get to prioritization. Now, what does that work look like? It looks like this. Um, certainly, you may not need to do every single one of these things before you get to prioritization, certainly in situations where um, you know, time to market is exceptionally valuable or um, you, know, you are not the first person in this space, um, you're kind of building something that is um, you know, really more standardized, but um, all of this and rigor in all of these ceremonies is going to help give you a better outcome. Um, this really is a process where if you feed in garbage, you're going to get garbage. So uh, first and foremost, you know, make sure that you and your teams are being rigorous um, in these previous ceremonies that are then feeding into prioritization. Cool. All right, we did all those things. Um, you know, looking at frameworks, um, I really like frameworks and utilizing them uh, within my teams first because it can help, as I mentioned, sort of de-escalate some situations where things may feel really emotional. Um, my, my favorite example is we've all run into this, an executive runs into the office and says, hey, I had a great shower thought, uh, so we're gonna wipe the roadmap or we're just gonna do this thing that I thought of for the next quarter. Um, or you have a customer that is just kind of 
bending your ear or uh, the head of customer success and threatens to go to RFP if you don't build the one thing that they need. And of course, the one thing that they need uh, is different from everything else that you've already validated that your other users need. Um, pointing to a third party system that you all agree on and being able to say like, you know, I, I think it's great that you want to, you know, give horses skateboards, but this system that we're utilizing doesn't agree on that. And, and here's why we think this is a better idea. I will also say they can lead to a false sense of security. So um, if you're leaning really hard on the framework and you're kind of getting outputs and you're not quite confident kind of why things are the way they are or things kind of start to smell a little weird, um, it can be good to sort of revisit and see if a new framework is more useful for you or for your team. Um, you know, like any process, uh, you should always revisit the process, see if it's working for you and your team. Um, at natural inflection points, you'll probably need to update them accordingly. So um, a big change in the market, a uh, change in your team, um, a change in your product or product area, um, a dark horse event, all these things are good times to be able to kind of review and see Ah, are my processes serving me and my team or are they not? Great. And finally, any framework you choose should help you do all these things. Most importantly, it should help you do all these things faster than without a framework. If you are kind of getting bogged down in the details of how these processes work and scheduling these processes and explaining these processes, um, that's not serving you and that's not serving your team. So especially if you, know, you are new to kind of utilizing some of these new frameworks, um, it can be helpful to utilize a lightweight version uh, before sort of diving in or you know, remix something uh, that works for you and your team. Uh, but keep that in mind. Um, the time is something that you need to keep in mind as well. Great. So I love this visualization. Um, this is by Daniel Zacharias uh, from a blog called Folding Burritos, uh, because all product and dev uh, blogs have to have a funny name. That's just legally how it works. Um, and I love, love, love this visualization because uh, we're given not only kind of a collection of um, frameworks that you can choose from, um, but we are given the information of you can choose based off of what data you have available to you. So we see on one axis, we have the qualitative and quantitative, and the other we have internal and external. So what type of data am I working with and where is my data coming from? And as a product manager, it is so vital to be aware of all of those things um, and also aware of you know, both the strengths and the drawbacks um, and just being honest with yourself, right? If you're a seed round or series A startup that uh, is you know new to market or trying to release in market um, and you're burning through cash, um, something like a very simple financial analysis um, is going to be pretty useful to you and that's okay. Uh, whereas if you're you know kind of in a more mature market, um, you have a good mix of qualitative and quantitative data um, as well as internal and external um, or maybe you're in a situation where you want to push against your sales org, maybe you're trying to be less sales led, um, you could try something like a buy a feature. I've actually done that before and engaged my sales team. And um, I don't know if you'll have the same results, uh, but I will say when we uh, kind of tallied up everything after that exercise, we actually got basically the exact same roadmap that we already had. So it was really satisfying. Um, anyway, that's why I love this. It's, I think, so important as product managers to be mindful of the data we have be realistic about the data we don't have or don't have yet, um, and play to those strengths. Um, it's also a great way as a product person to understand, ah, we're missing a lot of you know, qual data. Let's go and kind of double how many user interviews are we doing. Or, ah, we're getting a ton of info from analysts, but uh, we really don't have a lot of usage numbers. Let's go kind of figure out what's going on there. Cool. So with that, I love to go through a few frameworks that I find to be particularly valuable and that I regularly lean on. Um, I'll also go through two personal examples of how I've utilized those in my past companies. And finally, I'm going to go through some frameworks that I don't find to be as useful. That will be a fun, spicy part of my talk. So frameworks I regularly use are both the Kano model and user story mapping. How many of you have heard of either of these models? Cool. How many of you are using one of these models actively today? OK, good, about half. Cool. Um, so first, the Kano model. The Kano model was invented by Noriaki Kano in 1984, and he created it to help dispel the assumption at the time that any feature or any new functionality that you were adding to your product or features um, would increase customer satisfaction. I think it seems quaint to look back on that today and 
uh, feel that people have that assumption, but regardless. Um, what I love about the Kano model is that it tracks um, these different sort of items over kind of must be performance and attractive, um, but most importantly, it tracks them over time. So it is time-based, uh, which forces product or product managers to be mindful of the evolution of your competitive market and of user expectations. Um, it immediately kind of grounds you in this idea of, ah, what can we do to drive value now versus what may we need to iterate on or evolve upon in order to make sure we are continuing to drive value or even pushing that value up into you know, the attractive or the delighter sort of realm. Um, I'll give you an example actually, which is perfect. Uh, when I first did this talk a few, few years ago, um, I always uh, gave an example of a delighter as when I stayed at a hotel in Perth, um, they left me a custom poem every night before I went to bed, which I just thought was so delightful. Um, now, if a hotel did that, I would just say, Oh, that's cute. They printed out something from chat GPT. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, that is the Kano model. Uh, another model I really rely on a lot is user story mapping, um, sometimes just called story mapping. Um, this is invented by Jeff Patton in 2005. There's also a really great book. If you want to do a deep dive on it, you can add that to cart. Um, so what I love about user story mapping is all of the work that you are thinking about doing or validating or planning on doing um, has the immediate context of the user's problems or their job to be done. So you can immediately visualize, okay, uh, wait, and why do we agree upon a different variant of this toggle in our design system, even though we already have three other toggles? Oh, I see, okay, because they're unable to do this particular flow. So I love the, this, uh, this visualization because it immediately gives you that context and anyone else um, that kind of has access to this as well. What's also nice about it uh, is you can slice it horizontally to create um, you know, individual releases or um, what Dr. Alistair Cockburn would call um, a walking skeleton. So kind of individual slices of functionality that have legs and see if it walks. And if it falls over, uh, you can kind of figure out what went wrong and then kind of go from there. But again, it keeps all of this within the context um, of the user and the user's job to be done. Great. So how have I used this in my own work? Um, when I was at Vimeo about three years ago, three years ago at this point, um, I was helping to lead our enterprise teams. Um, and we were relatively new within the enterprise space at the time. Um, so we had customers that onboarded and were really excited and would sometimes need to scale um, up to 100x within a relatively short period of time, uh, enterprise years, which is like six months. So think like going from thousands of users to like millions and millions of users. So it's scary and exciting at the same time. Um, so what I needed to do with my team is make sure that we were serving all of our appropriate personas, but also serving them at the appropriate point across the consumption and scale of our platform. So the type of user that is uh, making a purchasing decision is one. Uh, the type of user that is then um, standing up your platform and onboarding folks and getting kind of things set up and ready to go and kicking the tires, that's a different person. The third person that is then going to be most heavily kind of utilizing your system, creating content, searching, uh, chatting, doing all those things is a different person. And so understanding that whole journey at scale uh, was vital for our teams so that we didn't get siloed into um, kind of what I call saleable units or Oh, you have you know role-based access control. Great, that's a check mark on the RFP. Oh, great, you know you have um, you know SSO and SAML compliance. Great, that's a check mark. And it's great to have those check marks, but if you don't do the work of understanding how those work over the journey um, of your customers, um, you know, and so you're gonna have a great you know onboarding score, CSAT score, and within six months you're gonna have some really angry uh, customers. <laughs> Um, so at Vimeo, we utilized uh, story mapping pretty effectively uh, to make sure that we were keeping all of these in mind when we were weighing our different um, pieces of functionality that we, we need to prioritize and do very quickly. Great. Um, when I was at Pendo, I was leading our platform team and we had the ability to do a zero to one launch, which is always really fun. Uh, what we focused on was a uh, feature called data sync. Um, so our customers had the acute problem of not being able to effectively take out their product data from within our system and make sure they could then mix and match it um, with other systems of record. So think a CRM like Salesforce, uh, think a um, data pool or a uh, data lake, lake house uh, like Microsoft Fabric. Um, so 
we really needed to act on this acute pain as quickly as possible. And through our research, it became immediately obvious that time was a massive variable of value for us. Uh, we were certainly not first to the party, uh, but we wanted to make sure we could unblock our customers. And then from there, you know, make sure uh, that they were able to be successful and iterate effectively. So we utilized what I would call, you know, Kano Light. This is where kind of remixing your frameworks uh, gets into effect. Um, we knew as time being the biggest variable, we wanted to get something out there that had legs and that immediately unblocked our customers. And from there, we knew we could then kind of layer in, you know, new functionality, functionality that would even potentially be considered, um, you know, delightful. Um, but from there, we just kind of knew at first we just needed to get there. Um, so Kano Lite was really a great way for us to understand, you know, not from immediate launch, but iterating after what that could look like. All right, great. This is the fun part of the talk. Frameworks I don't recommend. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Moscow Rice or Weighted Shorts Job First? Okay, how many are using one of these frameworks? Yeah, okay, all right, you don't have to be shy, it's okay. Um, so Moscow is just stack ranking with extra steps in my brain. Um, you lose any and all of the context of why someone puts something as must versus why someone puts something as should. Um, sure, you can have, I guess, you know, militant uh, descriptions around each of these, but uh, it doesn't really do you a ton of help if you're trying to translate this to someone else. Um, and in my mind, it just negates the entire value of the framework in the first place of making it not personal. Um, so, you know, I'm arguing with John and John thinks it's a should, but I think it's a could. Um, what does that even mean? And are you going to take my word or John's word? Uh, Rice. So Rice, I have seen orgs uh, use this successfully only when everyone agrees upon the definitions and the definitions are immovable. So confidence high is always 90, medium is always 50, low is always 10. And this is true across all the orgs, across the entire company for all of time. Um, as you can imagine, this probably doesn't scale well. Um, but you know, that being said, I can see the a, attraction for it. Um, for folks, especially that are more quant focused. So think your head of sales, your CRO, um, but I just find that uh, at the end of the day, a lot of times people will see the output and think, hmm, I really thought that would be higher up. Uh, let me just kind of see what we're already doing for weights for R or for I, um, and then we'll see what the output is after that. Um, and I think it also lends a extra false sense of security because numbers don't lie. Um, but when you know we are fairly arbitrary in how those numbers are generated, um, it, it's not useful as a prioritization framework. Um, and finally, we did shortest job first. Um, I don't really have anything productive to say. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry your org is safe. If you want to like talk about it and have some product therapy after, just come find me. All right, great. Uh, we prioritized. Now what? We did it. Congratulations. We all win at product management. We can go home. No. Uh, you need to create your roadmap. So your roadmap is the synthesis of your prioritization. Um, this is the tool that then communicates all that hard work that you and all the other important people did in the room to prioritize. So make sure that you are creating a document or more likely than not multiple documents for multiple appropriate audiences uh, that can easily and effectively communicate what that prioritization is and why. And most importantly, make sure it is in a centrally easily accessible place, not floating around in JIRA or you know, Power BI protected area. Um, share it out and align. The more feedback you can get on it, the better. And that will drive alignment and that will drive clarity. Um, so make sure you are doing all those things. So if you can take away anything from my talk, these are the things I want you to take away. Uh, when you are choosing frameworks for prioritization, uh, think about the types and the sources of data you have available to you and be realistic. It's okay if you're kind of missing a big gap in quality data or quant data or internal or external data. Work with what you got. Uh, become comfortable with a handful of those frameworks and be ready to utilize whatever makes sense. I would especially say if your org has kind of gotten comfortable with a specific framework uh, a year or two years, depending on what your kind of typical development and release cycle is, um, try something new. See if it works better. If it doesn't, great. You know your current model is working really well. Um, no framework is a silver bullet. So you should always be questioning the output and again, making sure it is serving you. Um, and none of this work means anything if you don't share it out and realign with your stakeholders. So remember that you have various audiences uh, for the outcome of this work and make sure that you are communicating to them clearly and appropriately. 
great. Uh, with that, thank you all so much for being here for your time today. Uh, you can learn more about me, uh, about these resources at castifine.com forward slash PMF. Um, and I'm excited to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Cassidy, thank you so much. Yeah. Love that. All right, so we have some time for some questions. Please give me a hand up and we can run over to you to find, I see, some, whichever, whoever's closest to you. Um, we can start. We have a man just on the left hand side here. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, usually, I, when we talk about uh, finding um, defining some concepts or dimensions for prioritization, uh, do you would you agree or disagree with wading in the uh, concept of effort or uh, capacity? Because that's usually something that has nothing to do with the value of the request itself. But obviously, it's not the same whether it's going to take us two weeks or six months to implement something. How would you try to fit that in in the in all these uh, possible frameworks? Yeah, it's a great question. I like. It's a great question. So, you know, when you're going through the prioritization process, your dev and design partner should be with you every step of the way. Um, should the actual level of effort be one of the first decisions you make based off of what you want to do? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, if it becomes a block to your product being viable or valuable, um, then absolutely. So that's where it becomes really important to bring in your dev team as part of that early process to make sure that you're not accidentally kind of going all in on an idea that can actually never make your business any money or that isn't technically feasible at all. Here, we have a gentleman down here at the second. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, just before you, there was a gentleman in this room who spent a lot of time explaining how the ICE framework is super great. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's more great. <laughs> it. uh, can, can you explain a little bit more on uh, how, where did you see that it doesn't work? Uh, what are the downsides so that now that we've read his book, uh, we can also <laughs> complement our knowledge with your experience. Yeah. So Itamar is not the only proprietor of Rice, so I'm not like here to just say, don't listen to it. You should definitely listen to Itamar. Um, what I'm saying is um, situations where I've seen Rice fail is where your entire organization does not have a consistent definition of what each of those items are. So for example, the wheel that he showed, um, you know, you would always have to agree that, um, you know, one certain level is always a four, for example. Um, and I think the wheel does a pretty good job of that. Um, but there's still some areas of flex that could be questionable. Um, and, you know, again, um, the goal of prioritization is to drive conversation. Um, but if you are, again, in a situation where you don't have consistent agreement on the weights of each of those variables, um, then it just becomes who says what or who thinks who is, what is the most important at that time. Um, so places where I've seen it fail is effectively where an org says, oh, actually, you know, this semester we're going to kind of give these things different levels of confidence because we can blew up all our OKRs, um, you know, and then this team's going to do it this way, but that team's going to do it that way. But then we like this team more, so we're just going to do their stuff. So, um, you know, versus there are, you know, orgs I've seen where it has been successful and they've just been militant about the definitions. They literally will give their team like a calculator and they can't do anything outside of that. So um, that's where I have seen it be successful. Other questions from the audience? I see a gentleman right in the middle. It's hard to see. Yeah. You got the spotlight on you. Which yeah. Is <laughs> standing off the stage. Anybody else? By the way, in, in anticipation, then just. To... Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned something about a Kano light model you used. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain a little bit about the light part? Yeah, I mean, light is, I think, a bit cheeky. Really, it was just our team had no experience with it, so I didn't want to be militant about, okay, we are going to follow it in this way, and these things that kind of fall off um, you know, the chart we are not going to do explicitly. Um, it was more pushing my team and how we could understand that time for us was the biggest variable of value and then understanding over over time where we could you know release sort of walking skeletons if you would um that would satisfy and unblock immediately our um you know our key customers uh, our, our partner customers we're already working with and then theoretically over time what we would iteratively test to try to keep driving us up towards that um, you know, to lighter scale, if you will. Um, I don't have like a specific Kano light framework for you, but I, I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. I hope that helps. 
And I saw somebody on our, on my left, over on this side, I believe. Anybody else? Yeah. We have a couple of minutes left, which is, I love these Q&A parts, but that's so <laughs> torturing and nasty. You get your steps. Perfect, thank you. I have a question. We are a startup that just got the pre-seed in the field of B2B SaaS. Cool. And now we have we hired a bunch of people. Now we have thousands of tasks flowing around. I'm here on the, the first time on this festival with the honor of having to manage this product. <laughs> and there's thousands of YouTube videos and talks and everyone has different opinions and different frameworks and different podcasts. What's your recommendation on where to start to focus our, our yeah, things to do on? Yeah, first of all, uh, congratulations. Um, that is a wild and crazy ride and uh, product I think all of us feel is really special. We wouldn't give it up for anything, but it's so hard and sometimes it can feel really lonely. So I hope you are finding all these talks really helpful and connecting with folks. Um, gosh, where to start? I would say anything that helps you better understand your customer and your customer's jobs to be done or the problems that they're facing, um, that will then kind of feed into their prioritization and really anything that will help drive communication across those teams, um, depending on how quickly you're growing, how quickly you're hiring people. I'm sure things are pretty chaotic. Um, back in my time at Vimeo, when I started, it was early COVID, we were 600 people. By the time I left a year later, we were 1600. So, uh, you know, driving, you know, prioritization alignment across that was really tricky, but we just kind of did what we needed to do and went from there. So I would say focusing on, you know, anything that gives you better insight and confidence in what your true users problems are, jobs to be done. Um, and then just picking a few lightweight frameworks, nothing crazy. Like you don't need to do like a research paper on it, try it. If it works, great. If not, try something else. Thank you, Rachel. And we have time for one last question right in the middle on the right hand side. Thank you again for a really good talk. Yeah. Um, one thing that I struggle with is that we prioritize for ages and ages, and then we never start developing. Yeah. How do you know that your prioritization is good enough such that you can start trying things out? Yeah. I mean, I think the answer is that it, <laughs> there's a running joke of me and my product friends that the answer to every product question is it depends. So it depends. Um, it depends on especially your company's kind of cycles of you know, release and delivery. I'm currently somewhere where I would say we are, you know, a bit more waterfall. We're a very horizontal platform team that's serving multiple um, internal customers at Microsoft. So like Dynamics 365 teams, um, but also external customers. So um, our cycles for prioritization tend to be a bit longer um, and we have to kind of naturally find that wiggle room within it. Um, in terms of feeling confident in your current prioritization, I would just kind of look at, again, what natural cycles feel appropriate for you and for your business. Um, if you're a CI business, that's great. You're going to need to prioritize a lot more frequently. If you are a true waterfall business, um, you know, that is selling on-prem software, it's probably going to look a lot different. So, um, you know, I'd say all that. And then finally, just, you know, having confidence in the rigor in your work that led up to it. Um, you'll start to feel if you're prioritizing and you're missing things or something doesn't feel right or you're making assumptions. Um, that's why I highlighted Kano and user story mapping because they have a natural affinity to push on areas where people tend to be lax in their work. So um, for user story mapping, you really have to understand the jobs to be done. If you don't, you literally can't fill it out. Um, for Kano, you really need to understand how you expect your market to mature over time and your users' ex expectation to mature over time, which means you need to understand your users and your customers. If you don't, you literally can't fill it out. So um, that would be my suggestion. Yeah.